This clip shows the Japanese battleship Nagato at the end of World War II. The deck markings indicate Allied planes that the battleship gunners claim to have shot down. Japan started the war with 11 battleships, and the Nagato was the only battleship still afloat at war's end, although it was not operational. In contrast, the U.S. possessed 23 battleships at the war's end. The U.S. Navy faced a problem at the start of the war. The Navy's only armor-piercing bomb was a jury-rigged artillery armor-piercing projectile fitted with a stabilizing fin, tail fuse, and bomb rack lugs, as defined on this page from a declassified 1945 Naval Aviation Bulletin. These makeshift bombs possessed the required deep penetration needed, but did not have sufficient explosive charge. This was due to the thick wall casing needed to maintain its structural integrity while being shot out of a gun barrel. To be effective, a bomb used in a ship attack must have sufficient velocity, armor penetration power, be delayed fuse to detonate below the ship's water line, and have sufficient explosive fill to significantly damage or sink the ship, as discussed in the channel's last video on bomb selection for carrier destruction. To mitigate this issue, the Navy designed two new armor-piercing bombs which could penetrate up to 8 inches of battleship deck armor. The intent of this video is to review the Mark I 1,600-pound armor-piercing bomb's characteristics in fusing, application, and detail how it was used in a dive bomb and medium-altitude attack on an IJN battleship. We will also address the bomb's combat effectiveness during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. This page from a 1945 U.S. Navy Bombs and Fuses document outlines characteristics and a cutaway of the 1,000-pound and 1,600-pound Navy-designed armor-piercing bombs. We will focus on the Mark I 1,600-pound bomb size, as this was the type recommended in attacking IJN battleships. The bombs are 83.5 inches in length, 14 inches in diameter, with a steel wall casing thickness of 1.3 inches. The bomb's weight equates to 1,590 pounds when filled with 215 pounds of explosive D. This explosive fill was selected over TNT due to its insensitivity to the bomb's strike shock expected. The bomb has a pointed nose for armor penetration, and it's fitted with a Mark 228.08 second time delay tail fuse. The fuse will start the bomb's detonation train 0.08 seconds after contact with the battleship's upper deck. This will allow penetration into the lower decks below the waterline at detonation. This page shows characteristics and a cutaway of the bomb's Mark 228 tail fuse. The fuse was designed for use in armor-piercing bombs only. The fuse will be armed when its vein has rotated 150 to 160 revolutions. Its 0.08 second time delay element is here. The fuse will be armed at an air travel distance of 1,100 feet. The minimum arming altitude is 200 feet. This page from a 1945 Terminal Ballistics Data document discusses the type of bomb needed to destroy a heavily armed battleship. Attacks on armored targets are generally not successful. Bombs do not possess a strike velocity penetration power from a low altitude attack. They do possess a strike velocity from high altitude attacks, but at the cost of bomb placement accuracy. A general purpose bomb can be used to attack an armored battleship, but it must be fused to detonate above the armored deck in which it cannot penetrate. Its detonation will tear into the armored deck. For example, a detonating 2,000 pound general purpose bomb can punch through 4.8 inches of a steel armor plate. The Navy designed armor piercing bombs should not be used on armor thicknesses greater than 7 or 8 inches as case deformation may occur. This table from an October 1944 Joint Army-Navy Committee on Bomb and Fuse Selection document outlines the recommended bomb-fuse combinations to attack Japanese battleships based on bomb release altitude. The battleship classifications include Congo, Fuse, Yamashiro, ISE, and Nagato. The columns represent the altitude of attack, bomb type and size, nose fuse time delay setting, and tail fuse time delay setting. The charts, notes, and annotations are listed here. These battleships are older design and some have been refurbished and modernized twice. The main and superstructure decks are likely 0.25 to 0.75 inch thick armor. The second deck, located 6 to 8 feet below the main deck, is likely 3.5 to 4.5 inch thick armor. The MK-1 armor-piercing bombs should be released at altitudes at or above 7,000 feet to ensure sufficient strike velocity. This channel-built table lists the 12 battleships of the IJN, including classification, name, 
Year Commission, Date Sunk, Seeking Agent, Seeking Ordinance, and Notes. These were the 11 IGN Commission battleships as of December 7, 1941. These 10 were commissioned between 1913 and 1921 and considered the old battleships. By war's end, only the Nagato was afloat. The Yamato and Masashi were the newer type super battleships. These are considered super battleships given they are roughly twice the displacement as the older battleships, bigger guns, and have much thicker armor. Addressing the Navy recommended bomb loadout for these super battleships is a video for another day. The attacking agent and sinking ordnance varied with attack. Bombs were involved in six of the 11 carriers that were sunk. The Congo was the only battleship sunk by a submarine by three torpedoes. The names of Japanese battleships were taken from Japanese ancient provinces, as shown on this chart from a 1945 Naval Intelligence Reference Manual. This image shows a 1915 commissioned IJN Congo side, top, rear, and front view. The key to sinking a ship is to get the bomb to penetrate and detonate below the water line. This is a function of the bomb's velocity, strike angle, and armor penetration capability. This is why torpedoes are so effective as they always strike below the water line. The most accurate aircraft bomb attacks will be by dive bombers, but the bomb's strike speed is reduced as compared to a high altitude attack. Experience has shown that ship magazine strikes are usually fatal and should be targeted if possible. This image represents the magazine location of an older IJN battleship. The ship's magazines are located here and should be targeted by the bombs and or torpedoes. The main deck and superstructure deck armor thickness is 0.5 inches. The second deck is 6 feet below the main deck and it's armored to a thickness of around 4 inches. We can use the battleship's geometry and the bomb ballistic data to estimate the detonation location of a Mark I 1600-pound armor-piercing bomb within the battleship during a dive bomb attack. Assume a Curtis Hell Diver is attacking the battleship with a single Mark I bomb, approaching the target at a dive angle of 60 degrees, releases a bomb at an altitude of 2500 feet at a speed of 345 miles per hour. We can estimate the bomb strike speed and angle using this plot. Enter the plane's bomb release speed and dive angle. Draw a horizontal to the chart's vertical axis. Track the bomb's 10.6 second time of fall intersecting the altitude of release. Draw a horizontal line to the vertical drop of the plane's speed and dive angle. Read off the bomb's vertical speed of 580 feet per second, horizontal speed of 270 feet per second, and strike angle of 65 degrees from the horizontal. The bomb will strike the upper weather deck at a speed of 640 feet per second, or Mach 0.58, at an obliquity angle of 25 degrees. At this speed, and assuming deck penetrations will not slow down the bomb, it should detonate around 51 feet down from the uppermost deck during its 0.08 second fuse delay duration. Detonation will roughly be here, exactly where you want it to detonate, well below the waterline, close to the lower hole. We need to check if the bomb's strike speed imparts enough velocity to penetrate the three layers of deck armor. This chart represents the thickness of armor plating bombs can penetrate based on the type of bomb and release altitude. The chart is valid for a plane in a 60 degree dive with the bomb released at a speed of 345 or 402 miles per hour. At a release altitude of 2,500 feet, a 1,600-pound armor-piercing bomb can penetrate up to 3.8 inches of armor. In this attack scenario, the bomb will penetrate the two half-inch thick armored decks, but lose kinetic energy to penetrate through the lower four-inch thick deck. The bomb lacks a penetration power to punch through all three armored decks. It will detonate 16 feet below the superstructure deck around here. This detonation occurs above the waterline. This is an ineffective attack. Dive bombers attacking in this zone are ineffective. None of the release speeds, altitudes, or bomb type combinations will the bomb be able to punch through 5 inches of armor. To be effective, the bomb needs to be released in this shaded zone by either releasing the bomb at a higher altitude or faster speed or both. Another option is a higher altitude level bombing attack like dropping the Mark I bomb from the recommended minimum altitude of 7,000 feet. At this altitude of release, the Mark I bomb can just penetrate 5 inches of armored plate. The bomb will penetrate the three layers of deck armor and detonate below the water line. This is why the Navy recommended the level flight release altitude to be a minimum of 7,000 feet for horizontal bombing. 
So did the new armor-piercing bombs live up to their expectations? Short answer, no. In practical application, an armor-piercing bomb released from a dive bomber can only penetrate around 3 inches of armor. From a 1944 U.S. Navy review on the Battle of Leyte Gulf, they've had little effect in damaging armored battleships. All bombs used to attack battleships were either semi-armor-piercing or armor-piercing. They were ineffective against Japanese battleship armor. Their damaging effect was less than same size instantaneously fused general purpose bombs. The performance of aircraft deployed torpedoes and bombs against Japanese battleships is considered poor. Either the Japanese ships are more armored than we thought or our weapons are not working as expected. Based on armor-piercing bombs' shortcomings, mainly lacking penetration power, it is recommended that in lieu of attacking battleships with existing armor-piercing bombs, large armor-piercing rockets be developed to attack armored warships. The rocket should provide the necessary speed to penetrate any battleship armor and carry an explosive fill matching the 1,000-pound armor-piercing bomb. If you found this Mark I 1,600-pound armor-piercing bomb deep dive review informative, please consider supporting the channel by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to World War II U.S. Bombers.